interdisciplinary health workforce study spring webinar event focusing on the latest trends and research in the nursing workforce. We are pleased to have you joining us for today's webinar. Before I get started, I have a few center announcements to share with you. First, Peter Beerhouse, David Auerbach, and Doug Steger have published findings in the March 1st Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, that found dramatic growth between 1960 and 2010 in the proportion of physicians who are married to highly educated spouses. In 1960, less than 10% of physicians were married to a highly educated spouse, a proportion that grew to nearly 60% by 2010. Moreover, such physicians were significantly less likely to practice medicine in rural shortage areas. More information about this study and the link to the publication directly can be found on our website. Second, we'd like to encourage you to attend or even consider sponsoring the 2016 National State Forum of Nursing Workforce Centers annual meeting being held April 27th through 29th, taking place this year at Disney's Coronado Springs Resort in sunny Orlando, Florida. This national meeting is hosted by the Florida Center for Nursing and co-hosted by the North Dakota Center for Nursing. For more information, please visit the event calendar on our website and you can find direct links to register or more information. Finally, we'd like you to save the date for our next webinar coming up on Wednesday, April 20th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time titled Regulating Supply in an Era of Increased Demand, Nursing Scope of Practice and Patient Access to Care that will be presented by Michael Richards, MD, PhD, MPH, Associate Professor of Health Policy at Vanderbilt University. Again, please visit our website for this and more information at healthworkforcestudies.com. After our speaker concludes her presentation, we will have 15 to 20 minutes for discussion and questions and answers. Please feel free to type any questions you have in the area designated for questions on our menu bar. Um, excuse me. And we will get to as many as we can. We are recording the webinar today and we'll have it posted to our website. Mm -hmm. We have posted all of the previous webinars to our website if you've missed any of our previous webinars, um, you can find them there. You can also find the presentation mm -hmm. slides for many of the webinars posted within the event calendar on the center's website. Today's webinar focuses on studies that compared the cost of primary care provided to Medicare beneficiaries by nurse practitioners and physicians. Um, I'd like to take a minute to introduce our speaker, Jennifer Perloff. Dr. Perloff is a scientist and deputy director at the Institute for Healthcare Systems within the Schneider Institutes for Healthcare Policy at Brandeis University in Waltham, Massachusetts. Dr. Perloff has over 15 years of experience in evaluation and health services research. She is currently involved in a number of projects related to episodes of care, including one project that she will discuss today that used episodes to compare the cost and quality of nurse practitioner versus physician provided primary care. She will soon be joining a project designed to compare MP and MD delivered um, multiple sclerosis care as well. She is also the project manager on Dr. Christopher Tompkins' four-year project to develop a public sector episode grouper for Medicare. This groundbreaking effort will focus in a comprehensive patient-centered system with over 200 episodes that can be used to assess quality, cost, and efficiency for provider profiling and payment reform. Dr. Perloff completed a study for CMS to develop a methodology to determine the value of Medicare Advantage plans from a consumer perspective. And Dr. Perloff's current work involves analysis of large claims data sets, often in a time series context. She teaches research methods in the PhD program and participates in a number of dissertation um, committees. So, um, Peter may be joining us in a few minutes. I'm going to let save talking about next, next month's webinar and how it ties into today's webinar for him if he joins us. Um, but at this point, I think we'll go ahead and start today's webinar. So, Jen, you have the floor and are ready to begin. Okay, excellent. Thank you. I'm so pleased to be here. I'd love to talk about the work um, 
that we're doing in the nurse practitioner space, and it's particularly exciting to talk about it with folks who are doing this work and who, who, uh, who get it. So thank you for inviting me. Um, let me give you a little picture. Um, this work that I'm going to present today is a slice of a larger project that um, Peter Beerhaus spearheads, a group um, of projects that included um, looking at the methodological issues to comparing nurse practitioners and physicians so that we started with a lot of technical method stuff, which I love. Um, we focused on the cost of care, and then our current work will be looking at quality and eventually value. So we're trying to be as sort of relevant to the policy debates that are unfolding right now as MACRA uh, is being implemented and the merit-based incentive system is coming um, into focus. We want to be asking questions of the data that will help uh, inform that debate. So the project team is many uh, different organizations. So um, Peter at Montana State is sort of the, the head overarching uh, visionary for the project. Um, Karen Donlin at Mass General has led a lot of the survey work that's come out of this project, but certainly feeds our hypothesis generating and is a, a key player. Um, Catherine DeRoche is at Mathematica now, and she's my uh, partner in crime when it comes to claims data analysis. And then at Brandeis, we have a, a large and wonderful team that includes Moab and Razavi, Galina Zalewski, and Monica O'Reilly um, are all part of our team. So this is definitely a joint product. Um, so I don't think for this group I need to spend a lot of time saying why NPs. But clearly, we're asking a lot of these questions as we think about um, the looming primary care shortage, what is the role that nurse practitioners can play in the alternative payment model space, and as we have more baby boomers retiring, the landscape of the healthcare system is going to be changing. And as I said, the goal of our research and our work is to help inform um, the emerging new models. So, we, of course, are building on a body of literature that looks at some of these issues. And I think there's been a fair amount of research on the clinical outcomes and patient satisfaction, where we see that nurse practitioners and physicians often come out as comparable or, particularly in the satisfaction space, uh, higher ratings for nurse practitioners. There's a lot less research on cost when we looked at it, and the studies that we saw tended to be very small, so single site, often focusing on a single encounter and finding that a, a nurse practitioner and a physician uh, had the exact same cost for the same kind of encounter. Um, and in our thinking, that was too narrow of a time window to understand how care-making decisions play out. Um, and so we'll see in our work where we take some of these issues on. So the slides I'm showing here are not from our numbers, but these are national sort of estimates of the number of nurse practitioners with their own NPI, which is the Medicare billing number um, that a clinician needs to be able to submit bills. And clearly this data is older, um, and I would love to update this slide. But we can see, not surprising again to most folks in here, that there is uh, a steady trend in the increasing number of NPIs. And the data that we used for this study is from the 2009-2010 space. And I'm excited that our team is going to be adding some newer data um, soon as we look at quality. So this slide is talking more about the sample we used for this study, um, which is a Medicare claims database that we developed. And what's really interesting about our sample is that we, uh, we started with a random selection of NPIs for nurse practitioners, and we went and got all of the beneficiaries who saw those providers. So the 4,363 NPs in our original sample were a random selection of all providers um, in the country at the time. And, and then we took a tiny slice, 541 um, physicians as our comparison group. But what's really fascinating is that when we, when we collect all of the beneficiaries who touch this small number of providers, we end up actually with many thousands of providers in our data set. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that is. 
So we end up actually with a huge number of primary care physicians and a very uh, good sized sample of, of nurse practitioners. So this is the core sample that we're going to be using to compare the cost um, experiences of the patients associated with these, um, with these beneficiaries. So I, this is an extra little slide that um, we've developed. And one of the questions that we're going to investigate hopefully more in our work as we go forward, why do we end up with so many nurse practitioners in a sample that started with about 4,000? And in part, we think that a little bit of it lies in the fact that nurse practitioners are uh, many practicing in larger practices. So the TIN is a tax identification number. It's sort of a proxy for a practice, um, but a very loose proxy. Sometimes TINs are thousands of providers, and sometimes they're one or two. And what we just see in this single provider in the TIN um, more physicians are in these very tiny practices compared to nurse practitioners. But this is something we want to understand more about is the kinds of settings in which nurse practitioners are practicing um, primary care. So another piece I just want to touch on lightly, a real important dimension of our work is assigning beneficiaries to their primary care provider. And so this process of attribution um, is an important one to do well because you want to make sure that there's a true relationship between the beneficiaries and the and the providers and we did a lot of sensitivity testing and this is just a slide to give you a sense um, of considering different thresholds um, of relationships so we're looking at evaluation and management services and we're looking for a single clinician who accounts for the plurality of those services and so these cutoffs are different um, minimum thresholds that we impose. So we ended up using a 30% minimum threshold, which says that the, the clinician had to provide at least 30% of the evaluation and management care for that beneficiary to be assigned that beneficiary. Um, and we looked at higher thresholds, and one of the things you can start to see the number of providers who survive as primary care providers um, starts to go down. Uh, and that's true for both groups. But we also begin to see a pattern that the patients who have very, very strong relationships with single providers tend to either use a lot of care or very little care, only one or two visits in the year. And so we were worried about that selection bias. Um, so the study that I'm going to drill into a little bit more um, to start with looked at the total cost of care um, for beneficiaries. Their Part A, which is their hospital cost of care, Part B is their um, total clinician billing, and then particularly their evaluation and management billing. We also looked at RVUs, which are um, the uh, part of the formula of how clinicians get paid. They are the uh, resource value units, and it's supposed to indicate how much work or effort goes into a, a given task. And we use these funny RVU things um, because they're um, dollar free. And we wanted to get away from the fact that nurse practitioners are paid 85% of the fee for a physician in their area. The RVU doesn't have that dollar amount attached. Um, and so we wanted to add these in to the uh, list of outcomes that we considered as well. So we have one really important issue, and we'll look at this quickly um, in a minute. The, as we assign patients to providers, we have a pool of patients assigned to nurse practitioners and a pool assigned to physicians. Before we can compare them, we want to make sure that that's a fair comparison. And so this selection bias issue is this idea of whether or not the comparison is fair. So we use it, um, used a method called propensity score weighted regression. Um, and uh, I, I'll spare you my excitement about the method. <laughs> um, but it, it, the basic goal was to create balance between the two groups. And this slide, again, might be too methody, <laughs> um, but it gets me excited because this is the probability of seeing a nurse practitioner for both our panels or groups of patients. And they're really very, very similar. This is the group um, of patients who were actually signed to nurse practitioners, 
and these are the patients assigned to physicians. And we can see that they have a lot of the same characteristics. And it makes us feel confident that the propensity score regression is a good way to go. So this slide gets much more into the interesting part, which is the clinical differences between the cohorts. So this is the unweighted comparison, and these are a set of clinical characteristics. And we can see that taking congestive heart failure, for example, that the physician patients had a slightly higher 21% compared to 19% of the patients had CHF. And if we look down, we can see a slight sort of pattern that in certain clinical areas, the physician panel had a higher comorbidity burden or intensity of illness. And it's exactly this lack of balance that we wanted to address in our methods but always lingering in the back of our heads is this question, do we do a good enough job at making them comparable? So the, um, the panel, the weighted results on this side show how similar we were able to make the groups look um, statistically. But I just wanted to kind of raise this issue. Um, so we're diving right into the multivariate results because I want to um, get to some exciting new material. And we can see this is the inpatient, the Part B, and the evaluation management dollars. So these are the uh, expenditures for a given beneficiary over a 12-month period, 2010. And this is the important line. This is the differential payment for patients in the nurse pac practitioner pool. And what we can say, see for the inpatient cost, um, it's $18,000 less for a nurse practitioner assigned beneficiary. For the Part B, $531, and the evaluation and management is $52 less. But what's important and is not shown in the slide, um, these are the R squares of the model, but this uh, $18,000 uh, $1 um, is about 10%, oh, interesting, my math isn't quite working. Let's do the uh, evaluation and management one. This is about 29% uh, percent of the cost. So this is a very large sort of relative effect um, compared to the inpatient side where it's much smaller percent of the average cost. So just uh, the percentages gives us a, a more common sort of way of understanding whether $52 is a lot or little. And the pattern of the nurse practitioner costing less um, continues when we looked at the same um, outcomes but using the RVUs instead. So these were the outcomes that were uh, price neutral. And we multiplied every RVU by $40 just to make this look a little more interpretable. And $40 was the average cost uh, for a primary care RVU in 2010 when the data um, uh, come from. And so again, in the adjusted results, we see that the nurse practitioner is consistently lower cost um, as compared to the physician managed patients. And so that raised a question for us, and then this is another way of sort of looking at uh, the same idea. So these are the RVU results for um, the total provider cost. So that would include specialists and other providers as well as the managing provider. The evaluation and management services columns are going to be more likely to be that, that managing provider, although we know that there can be patients who have you know, more than one person who is overseeing and, and managing their care. Um, and so the size of the, the, the bars is just giving you another way of getting a feel uh, for the size and significance of the difference. So you know, once we've kind of established with all of the different sort of methods that we can throw at it, that there is what feels like a very consistent pattern that the nurse practitioner managed beneficiaries are less costly in a 12-month time period, that raises the important question of why. And uh, I think that that was sort of the next phase of our work was to look into that, that difference and try to understand um, what's happening there. So we borrowed some tools from uh, economists. And uh, I want to thank my colleague, Moab and Razavi, who's uh, 
critical to thinking about this and brought some innovative methods. But we did an Ohaka decomposition, um, which did not mean much to me before we started <laughs> doing that work. Um, and we had a couple of challenges in the way we did that. So for the decomposition, we looked at the expenditures over the course of a year in three different buckets. So the cost of care, we were saying, has something to do with the price or the pay rate, how much you pay uh, for the services, the intensity of the service, and that um, we can talk a little bit more, and then the technology mix. So these were sort of the ways we we're going to decompose or break the spending down to understand the differences between the nurse practitioner and the physician assigned beneficiaries. But as I mentioned before, we had this problem of the patient panels and the different clinical um, mix amongst the two different groups. And we tried many different ways of dealing with that issue and landed in a place where we actually, we stratified the patients by their severity, their clinical severity. So we made three, three buckets, a low severity group, a moderate severity group, and a high severity group. And we repeated the analysis in each group saying that to some extent, the patients should be clinically similar within each of these groups, making it more fair to compare. Um, we weren't able to integrate the, the severity into the models in, in a different way. Oops, went a little fast. So um, this table is uh, giving you a picture. We've got the low, the moderate, and the high risk patients, um, and, and these are the cutoffs for their stratum. So this is just giving you a picture of the NP and MD comparisons. So the expected charges for the physician patients um, are, are in this column, the same thing for the nurse practitioner. So we can see that the low risk patients cost less, and that's what we would want to see. That's a nice validation of our stratification. And it moves up linear, linearly just like we would like to see. So the high cost, high risk patients are the highest cost patients. Um, and we are looking at uh, the charges and the uh, counts of services. So these are sort of all of the inputs into the decomposition model. And I wanted to show, uh, just to give you a sense of the services that we were looking at and understanding sort of what the different patterns of care are. So these uh, are groupings of procedure codes. This is the Beto's grouping system for folks who are familiar with that. Um, and we were using that to get a handle, I'm gonna slide this over so I can see a little better, um, a handle on the differences. So we can see that the physicians tend to use more of the imaging services compared to the nurse practitioners. Um, we can see uh, differences in home visits. So this descriptive information which goes into the decomposition begins to get a sense so the physicians have a higher rate of ambulatory procedures. Um, lab tests, the two groups are very comparable. But this is useful descriptive information as we want to sort of understand and untangle um, the practice style differences between the different provider groups. And as we looked in the literature, this isn't something we saw a lot um, of information on. And for those who are on the call and might have information on studies like that, we'd love to, um, we'd love to hear about that work. Oops. Well, I've got to try. Maybe if I shift that back. There we go. Okay. Um, so this is the, the um, uh, razzle-dazzle part of the show today where we're showing um, some of the spider graphs of the decomposition analysis. And so this is the physician group. This is the nurse practitioner group. Um, and these are all of those service use categories we were just looking at in the other slide. And a couple of things to, to look at in this graph. What we can see here is that the, uh, the size and sort of depth of uh, the other service use line in the spider graph 
um, is much bigger in the physician. So we can see the nurse practitioners um, are providing sort of uh, many fewer of these things that fall into this other services bucket. Um, and we can see also here the um, uh, procedures. We see a lot more, again, the size of these parts of the spidograph are much bigger in the physician side. And again, many more office visits and much more imaging. So it, the, what we're seeing in the spidograph, the tiny shape is the same, but the size is different. So there's more, the physicians are doing more. Um, and another way to look at this, this may be a more sort of intuitive um, presentation of the decomposition. So what these bars are showing, we have the low, the moderate, and the high risk groups. And this is the, uh, again, let me try shifting so I can see the whole slide. Uh, the colors are subtle, so I apologize. But this is the top bar is the price difference. So is it that physicians charge more um, or less? This is the, uh, the oh, I'm sorry service mix. The top bar is the service mix, which is the kinds of services they're selecting. And an example would be um, ordering a um, more expensive or less expensive imaging test um, for the same kind of clinical scenario. I'm the middle bar, I apologize, this is the cost. This is the unit cost per service. Um, and then the bottom bar is the volume of services. And so what really jumps out is that this bottom bar, the volume, is really what drives a lot of the difference in the nurse practitioner versus physician um, uh, managed patient's cost. So that's part of what's driving. But, but the other component, the higher cost for the services that were selected. Um, and what's also striking from this graphic is that the differences in practice style are most pronounced for the highest cost cohort. Um, and the nurse practitioner and physician managed patients look much more similar for the low risk cohort. Uh, and again, that's probably not surprising because the higher cost patients, there's many more things happening. So there's more room for different kinds of practice patterns to emerge. And one would guess that for the low risk patients, there are many fewer encounters and things happening, um, but it looks like uh, the physician and nurse practitioner look more similar in that space. And just as we would like to see, the moderate risk group is right in between the two. So this cost decomposition work um, is work we're, we're pulling together right now. So this is cutting edge um, <laughs> sort of stuff. So I apologize if it's not as clear as some of the cost analysis, but I, I think this is really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and then let me slide over here. So I want to just uh, mention a couple of limitations that we want to keep in mind as we interpret these results. We did do the propensity score weighted regression, um, but there may still be unobservable clinical differences between the groups. And so we want to acknowledge that um, and, and couch our results uh, in terms of, of understanding that difference may still exist in some way, shape, or form. Um, we know that not everything that a nurse practitioner uh, does is accurately captured in claims. And so I'm sure folks um, on the call today have heard about this incident to billing challenge and uh, the basic issue is that in many situations a nurse practitioner is working incident to a physician and when that happens the bill may come in under the physician's NPI. So she or he, the nurse practitioner, is not billing independently. We do not get to see those claims and in fact they look to us like physician billed events and so those patients would end up in our physician bucket if they got assigned. So that's another important limitation to keep in mind. But, oops, let's see if we can get this. Given those limitations, um, there are a couple of conclusions that you know, we've been drawing from this work. So we clearly see this pattern that the nurse practitioner attributed beneficiaries appear to cost less 
systematically than the physician attributed beneficiaries looking over the course of a year. It does look like the closer you get to the primary care provider's locus of control, the bigger the difference is. And so that's that evaluation and management cost. Even though it was only $52, it's mm -hmm. a 29%, almost 30% difference in, in the cost of care. And so that's where the, the nurse practitioner effect appears to be the strongest. Um, Another thing that comes out of our work, I think, is the importance of time horizon when you're thinking about cost. So we did 12 months of total cost of care. Um, and again, to me, that's important because it provides an opportunity for care practice uh, decisions to play out. So differences in referrals, differences in the kinds of imaging tests that you order differences in the procedures can play out and be captured in 12 months of cost, but not in a single encounter. And uh, it was mentioned in the beginning, I, I, I like episodes of care, which is true. This work is not yet episode based, but that would be a, a unit of analysis right in between the total cost of care for a patient for a year and looking at a single encounter. Another good way to look at this would be to look at the cost of care for managing specific um, conditions. And that might be another uh, path forward that we'll consider in our work. Um, the decomposition analysis is beginning to show us that the nurse practitioner managed patients appear to have fewer and less expensive services. And that, that seems to be the, a bit about the practice pattern um, differences that are driving the, the cost differences that we see. Um, and the other thing that I noted that we noted was that the um, effect is the, is the most pronounced for the sickest patients. So again, I think that helps us think about as we're developing payment models um, you know and redesigning care where the best place is, to uh, pair physician and, physicians and nurse practitioners in terms of uh, care delivery. So um, I think I've been talking a lot, <laughs> and uh, I hope that uh, we can uh, have a bit of a dialogue if there are questions that um, folks would like to raise. And as I said, all of this is emerging uh, and ongoing work, and we're always eager to hear from folks who are doing work in similar space. Um, about what you're finding and seeing um, in your, your world. So with that, I'll pause and take a breath. Um. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Jen. Um, before we start the Q&A, um, and just a reminder, <clears throat> if you have questions, um, you can go to the questions area of your GoToMeeting toolbar and enter your question there, and we'll get to as many as we can um, to post to our presenter. Uh, before we start, and I'll give some time for people to do that, um, Peter wanted me to make a special mention of the webinar that will be given by Dr. Michael Richards next month on the 20th. Um, his webinar will focus on a study that assessed whether clinics with more non-physician clinic clinicians are associated with better access for Medicaid patients and lower prices for office visits. Um, so we think you'll find the work that Michael has been doing fascinating and very complimentary to the work that we've heard here today on Jen's webinar. Um, so just another plug there to bookmark that um, for next month. Um, okay, the first question we have is a bit of housekeeping in nature. Um, Jen, do you mind if we make slides available um, from your presentation today? No, nope, that's fine, but I'll send you my, my updated deck because I did find one spelling mistake just before we went live. <laughs> so I'll send okay. you the deck. Okay, great. We appreciate that. Um, I guess one thing that I was wondering while you were talking was, um, you know, did you find any variation regionally for for the your your findings? Like did some NPs in some areas of the country where, you know, did they tend to spend hot, more money on services or do they tend to cost less than other MPs in certain regions? Was there any um, effect in that nature? Well, that's a great question. Um, and I'm sure we would find regional differences. We actually purposefully controlled them away. So we tried to take regional differences out of our work um, 
in part because we know their practice pattern differences and they're also um, pricing differences in different regions of the country. So we can have um, geographic variables in our model that control for geographic variation. But it's a great idea as we dive into this um, practice pattern piece more is to understand the role of geography. So Dartmouth, uh, the Dartmouth Atlas folks um, have been expert in teasing apart geographic differences in, in practice patterns. And it would be very interesting to understand if nurse practitioner practice behavior mirrors what we see in the hospital and physician level. Um, I don't know if anybody knows the answer to that question, but that's, that's, a, that's a great one. So I'm great. making notes as we go. <laughs> <laughs> great. Um, I have another one here. Um, going back to your earliest slide, can you explain again how you captured the additional NPs and PCPs in addition to your random samples? and why there were so many more physician patients than NP patients in the sample. Okay, great. No, it's, it's an excellent question, and I think it's really important to understand, again, as we're sort of launching um, more into health reform. So we took um, a random sample of nurse practitioner NPIs, these provider IDs, and we got all of the patients that that, that NP saw during that two-year time window, 2009 and 2010. But because so these beneficiaries see so many providers, we managed to capture a huge number of other providers in that net. So I didn't include any of the slides, but each the average beneficiary sees something like eight or nine different providers in the course of the year. And at the extreme, uh, a single beneficiary could see 40 or 50 um, clinicians in a year. So to give you an order of magnitude, our sample is a million, our original sample is a million beneficiaries. We have 700,000 unique NPIs who touched those million beneficiaries. So I'd, I like to think of it sort of as a zone or man-to-man -man defense. <laughs> almost have a one clinician for each um, beneficiary. But there's an overinflation there, just to be clear for folks. Um, NPIs can be uh, lab facilities. They could be a dialysis center. Not all NPIs are clinicians. And so in our work, we tease those out carefully and, and try to only count physicians. But that's why um, Despite our modest size random sample, we were able to capture a huge number of clinicians. Um, one interesting side note, if you see one nurse practitioner in our data, it looks like you tend to see more than one nurse practitioner. And that's part of my curiosity about the practice patterns of nurse practitioners, that they may often work in larger practices that include more than one NP. Um, Obviously, we also see nurse practitioners who work in very small one or two uh, clinician shops as well. But, uh, but that, that's how we ended up with so many providers. Great. Um, I have one more question for you. Um, can the data be examined by rural versus metropolitan areas? OK, sure. So that's a great question. Um, I did not, again, provide any detail of all the covariates in the, in the cost model. We did include a rural urban flag, which we derived from um, the area resource file. So uh, we, again, just like the geography question, um, took that one off the table. We took the variance off the table. But we can definitely look at um, different, we could run the same model in the rural and the urban areas um, and look at the results to see if they're similar. Um, but we, we do know that being in a rural area does have an impact on, on the cost profile that we see. Um, so definitely a good question. Great. Uh, when describing the cost results, the effect of the 15% differential isn't quite clear. Um, if cost, cost differences are less than 10%, but approved charges are 15% less, 
are NPs providing more RVUs? Okay, so here, let's see if we can go back up there. Um, go to the multivariate, oops, I think I passed it. Um, so, right, so the nurse practitioners are paid 85% of the physicians, but when we look at this bucket, the total Part B allowed amount, these are all the physician bills um, accrued for that those beneficiaries over a year. So these bills include specialists, other primary care providers, um, everybody. Um, and then this column shifts down to just the evaluation and management type of service with, within the Part B billing. So the size of the effect for the E&M, this was where the effect was 29%. The Part B is about 17%. Um, and so we know that some of the impact that we see, some of the reason in this slide that the nurse practitioner managed patients cost less is that the nurse practitioner costs less. But that's exactly why we did the RVU analysis, which, you know, even though this is inflated by $40 to make it feel a little more interpretable, um, it is still sort of a significant and noteworthy difference. So for the um, total RVUs, which is equivalent to the total Part B payments, it's 15% uh, less. The nurse practitioner is 15% fewer RVUs. And for the E&M, it's 18% fewer RVUs. So um, one of the things we noticed when we drilled into the RVU um, makeup of the services NPs bill for a lot of zero-dollar RVU services. <laughs> um, and so it's both the types of services that nurse practitioners bill for, and then even within a cate given category of service, we sometimes see um, two patterns. One, that the nurse practitioner is billing for a lower intensity version. So we saw this with imaging um, sometimes, but often, the nurse practitioner billed for a higher RVU service. An example of this would be an imaging test with interpretation by a radiologist. We would see the physician ordering the, radi the imaging test without interpretation, but one of the practice patterns we saw was that the nurse practitioner did the imaging once, and that you didn't see it again. In the physicians, we saw more repeated imaging. And again, without knowing clinically what was happening for each patient, it just looks like they're different, potentially different practice styles. Um, and that's what we're trying to untangle a bit more in the decomposition. So I'm not sure if I answered the question, but that's a little bit more about sort of our thinking. Great. Thank you, Jen, for more clarification. Uh, nurse practitioners have a differing scope of practice from state to state. Would the variability of delivery of care affect the overall cost of care in fees versus MDs due to practice limitations? For example, some states prohibit nurses from prescribing narcotics, which may increase the cost of care for the patient having to see an MD provider than an MP provider. Okay, so that's a great question, and, and that's about the, the scope of practice differences. One important thing to point out, we don't have pharmacy costs um, in this study, there is a companion study that is um, beginning to, to look at that. So for our work, we wanted to try to, uh, we didn't directly take on the scope of practice question, and that would be something we could do moving forward is un untangle that a little bit. Because we controlled for geographic variation, it is likely that a lot of the um, scope of practice differences were captured in those co in those covariates. So we we probably muddy the waters a bit in terms of of really getting a sense of how scope of practice impacts this. Um, and I think we could we could probably generate some different hypotheses of the impact of scope of practice. But um, one thing I'll say in our quality work that we're moving forward with um, as we speak, that's one real important question for us. So I, I'm hoping that's something we can um, contribute more to um, in the future. Great. Um, and then I have kind of a clarifying question here. Um, was the spider graph 
truncated on the bottom of the physician side? Let's see. I, um, it, uh, it's a good question. Yeah, I, I think it is. Um, and that has to do with um, my cutting and pasting it into the slide, I think. So yes, it, it, you can see there's a bar here and it, it would dip down, oops, <laughs> it would dip down lower. So um, yeah, good catch. Okay, so that effect is just a little more pronounced there. Yeah, it is. So it, it's, it, it, it goes past the cost thresholds that set up the, um, the spider graph. Okay, I have another question for you. Uh, when you examine 12 months of patient experience, do most patients see their primary care providers every month, or does the 12 months cover, say, an annual visit or a short episode? Um, and then do NPs provide less expensive services or less frequent services? So um, great questions. Um, there is a, a HEDIS measure, appropriate use of ambulatory care for the uh, 65 um, plus age group, and that measure basically calls for two visits in the 12 month time period would be considered um, sort of minimum care. So we have in, in the observed data, in the actual sort of experience of, of Medicare beneficiaries, there is a tier of sort of low utilization folks. There are some people who never see a doctor or a nurse practitioner or anyone. Um, and we see though they're, that they're enrolled, but we see no service use for them. There's a cohort that does have sort of that minimum uh, one or two visits a year. Um, and then there's a large group that uses large amounts of care. And so what our 12 months is capturing is many episodes of care, both uh, ongoing chronic care management and that might be something that the primary care clinician is very involved with, and then acute episodes of care, and I'm sure there are lots of uh, treatment, surgical treatments and other kinds of treatment episodes. So the total cost of care measure is limited in that it, it, it smashes all of that together um, and gives us a little bit of a, a more muddied picture. So I think that's one of the reasons I get so excited about episodes is that it allows uh, sort of differentiating uh, the kinds of care that you're talking about. So in our quality work, for example, right now, we're delving into that sort of ambulatory care um, best practice and trying to quantify what percent of beneficiaries really are getting um, that recommended amount of care. So, Great. so the Thank answer you. is right now it's all smushed together. <laughs> kind of like Great. the graph. <laughs> Great. Um, one more clarifying question. On slide 14, uh, what was the duals category? Uh, let's see, slide 14. Um, oh, okay. So this, um, these are our multivariate models, and um, w these are the demographic characteristics that we included. So we have a flag for whether a beneficiary is dual eligible. Um, and that is um, whether or not they had state buy-in for their benefit. Um, and we know that that captures about 75% of the dual eligibles. There, there are lots of different ways to qualify for dual eligibility, so I want to be clear that that's an incomplete flag. We know from some of our prior work that nurse practitioners see a higher um, percent of dual eligibles than physicians, uh, and so this, uh, this row is capturing the fact um, that the dual eligibles uh, here are less expensive. Um, and this is, again, this is the RVU analysis, not the total cost um, analysis. The other demographics, uh, sex, we have a single race indicator, um, age is a continuous var variable. What's not shown, but all of these models include um, uh, a set of clinical uh, comorbidities as well. Um, and uh, I think what's also not shown, as I mentioned, there's a set of geographic covariates that look at the region and the uh, rural urban. 
Um, and in the uh, cost paper that came out in Health Services Research at the end of last year, there's a lot more detail um, on exactly what's in, in the models. Great. Um, I found one question I think might be a good one to wrap us up with. Um, okay. What kind of policy impacts do you think your research might have? Oh, that's a tough question. <laughs> I love that. Um, so, you know, my interest, um, I'm very interested in alternative payment models and care redesign. And so I'm very curious to understand how we can sort of build clinical teams that are, you know, efficient and effective for Medicare beneficiaries. So I think what I'm interested in untangling and understanding more about is the relative strength of nurse practitioners and physicians as um, uh, care managers and understanding how we can build and look at sort of co-produced care and work towards care models that uh, go to the strengths of each provider type. So what we're using this work to see is uh, what are the differences in how nurse practitioners and physicians treat and manage their patients and what can we learn about sort of the, the best in breed from, from all different kinds of clinicians and carry forward into alternative payment models. So that's sort of my fantasy answer. I think on a much more practical level, um, as we're debating the implementation of the merit-based incentive program, which nurse practitioners will be included in in a few years, we want to make sure that we understand how those payment models will affect um, the, the pay and practice of nurse practitioners and also try to help, you know, sort of shape the landscape so that uh, it's as favorable as possible um, to all different types of clinicians. So those would be my two answers, but that's a, the kind of question you always want to have fun <laughs> thinking about and playing with, so thank you. Great. Thank you, Jen. Um, thank you so much for taking time to present with us today, and um, we have some great questions from our audience, and we appreciate all of you attending today's webinar. Um, that will conclude our presentation. Don't forget to register for our April 20th presentation with Dr. Richards, and uh, you can find that on our website. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye.